Well, hi everyone and welcome to Dementia Chats. Today we're gonna to have a great conversation with our panelists who are all living with dementia. Um, my name is Lori LeBay. I'm the founder of Alzheimer Speaks and I started Dementia Chats because my mom lived with the disease for 30 years. Uh, she had Alzheimer's disease and I just learned so many beautiful life lessons and I truly believe People living with the diagnosis are the true experts, and it's silly for us not to have these conversations. Um, so our, our topic is really going to be what, what services, products, and tools do we need um, in, this, in this world? And what, what is working and do we need more of? And what hasn't uh, transpired yet needs to, someone needs to develop it uh, to support those living with dementia in their families. So I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. And Paul Ann, if you wouldn't mind going first. Paul Ann Gordon, and I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I was diagnosed with vascular dementia in 2012, so I've been living with this for quite a while now. And um, I'm involved in many advocacy efforts. They keep growing, <laughs> but I love it. It gives me a lot of sense of purpose, and I love it. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Mary? Hi, my name is Mary Radnofsky. I have a uh, genetic uh, condition called subcortical leukoencephalopathy, which is a rare uh, degenerative brain disease that leads to dementia. I've been diagnosed for 14 years and I still live independently. And I also advocate for the human rights of people with dementia. Wonderful. Thanks, Mary. Michael? My name is Michael Ellenbogen. I'm an international advocate for dementia, and I've been living with it for, I think, 21 years and uh, beating all the odds. And uh, nowadays, I'm starting to kind of take a little step back and uh, try to enjoy life again. And uh, I'm still doing my advocacy, but nowhere near as much. Great. Thank you. Um, Craig? Hi, my name is Craig Hankey. I'm from Wisconsin. I was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia in 2013. Um, as Mike said, I'm doing very well on beating the ads, I think. Um, I'm involved in Dementia Mentors, and I do try to do advocacy where I can. Wonderful. Thank you. And Harry, how about you? My name's Harry Urban. I live in Pennsylvania. I was diagnosed over 15 years ago with Alzheimer's, um, and I'm beginning to show more signs of vascular dementia. But um, I'm a strong advocate, and there is life after your diagnosis. Thank you. And Lisa, how about you? I'm Lisa, and I live in northern Indiana, and I was diagnosed a year and a half ago with uh, dementia. And currently I'm 55, so I don't know how old I was then, but I think I'm 53. And um, I try to run a YouTube channel that uh, talks about dementia and how uh, we still are productive members of society and not lock us up yet. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm just going to add for Lisa, too, she's a single mom of three boys. So she's got her hands full with this. And they're all going through puberty right now. So. <laughs> Woofy! <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I'm going to have Michael kick us off with our topic today about um, what services do we need and, and kind of, Michael, why, why you thought this would be a good topic at this time. Well, I have to tell you, as you probably know already, because you, you are kind of the pioneer in this, uh, in your uh, state. You know, they started Dementia Friendly America, I think, what now, about 10 years ago where you're at. And uh, it's been very slowly progressing within the U.S. Uh, they started an organization uh, which was an offshoot of the organization your area had started, uh, I think now about four years ago, maybe five. And uh, it's now become a national organization based on the model in your state. And uh, they've slowly been trying to get all the states involved to figure out different ways to enhance the lives of those living with dementia across the U.S. And while I think they're on the right path, 
I think there's a lot that's being missed by a lot of the people who are coming on board trying to do this. Uh, I mean, I could tell you in my state alone, Pennsylvania, I spent over five years trying to get the first dementia friendly site opened in Pennsylvania. It took me five years. Now that I finally got that started about a year and a half, two years ago, there's now four other places already starting, which is good. But while they are trying to do things for those with dementia, I don't believe they're getting it right. One of the problems I see, and I see this happening across the U.S., it's the people who are trying to create the different activities and the policies of what they think is going to help, but they don't include the people with dementia as a part of this. And as long as they continue to do that, I see total failure. Because while I'm involved locally at my meetings, and I've even offered myself for the uh, community next to mine, which is starting, they have me at the meetings but they don't ask for a lot of input. And when you give them a lot of input, they still kind of go with their way. They just want to give you the voice, but they don't listen to the voice. And I really think that's what they're all trying to do. They want to make you feel as a part of the team, but I don't believe that they really allow you to be the team, if you know what I'm saying. And I've heard the same thing from other people who I've spoken with around the U.S. Uh, who are on this uh, committees. And um, th to me, that's the most frustrating part that I see because they're trying to do good, but they're not listening to the people that need this the most. You can create all the damn activities in the world that you want. But if it's not going to help the people that you're trying to help, what good is it? So that's, th that's the one thing that I've seen now that I, you know, I, I, you probably never heard me really talk too negative about this, but it's now been five years that I've witnessed all this. And now I can speak on it because I've seen what's been happening. Uh, it's a good thing. Don't get me wrong what they're doing, but they have to improve. And I, I hope tomorrow while I'm at this meeting, uh, I, I will bring up some of these issues. Uh, the other things that I see as a problem is everybody's going their own way. Nobody wants to copy what the other person's doing. They're trying to all do different things. Because of that, they all have different names, which, again, as you know, you go from one community to the other, a different name. Well, what good is that for the person who's got dementia? They won't know what to look for. So that becomes very confusing for people like that. You know, we, we should standardize across the U.S. if we're going to do it in the U.S. Sorry, there's a train going by. <laughs> uh, and then you have what I see happening. We have a committee here in Pennsylvania. And it's about 12 people on the committee. We have the mayor and other people involved. But there's like two or three people that are key players who tend to ask for advice. But then they go on their own and do their own things. And then they come back and say, well, this is what we've done. But nobody really decided as a com committee, this is what we're going to do. So they kind of take things on on their own. And this is happening in other places, not just in my neck of the woods. So it's like if you're forming a committee, I feel that we should engage the whole entire committee to have a vote, not two or three people who think that they're going to be the kings and run the show. So I think those things need to start to change. We're in the right direction, but they're just some of my pet peeves at this point in time that I think are critical to the success of making this worthy in the United States. It's not enough to just have a name and say that you are dementia friendly. It has to be dementia friendly. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to jump in just because you referenced Minnesota um, before I pass the wand. You know, I, I worked with the Lutheran Home Association and actually we launched the first dementia friendly community in the U.S. And what I loved about working with um, the Lutheran Home Association was uh, Michael Clapp, the director, executive director, was very open to new, authentic things. I mean, he just, he, he's a very creative guy. He's very collaborative. And I remember him saying to me, Lori, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you like a half an hour, an hour with my staff. And if you can convince them to do this, we're in. 
And so I remember going down to Belle Plains and talking to his staff and he stopped me after like 10 or 15 minutes and my heart stopped and I thought, I blew it. I just blew it. And I'm like, what's, what's wrong? And he's like, look at them. They're in. You don't have to talk anymore on this. You don't have to pitch. We're in. And what was amazing, why I tell this story is I think passion is the key to really making a difference with this. And so we, we kicked off um, our dementia friendly community and I did like a keynote for two hours and we got all the, the players in and we invited, you know, everybody and their brother was welcome. People with dementia, families, businesses, the city, you know, fire police, um, you name it. And we had people from about seven counties out come to the meeting and I'll never forget their comment. And they, and, and this was multiple times people came up and said, how are you doing what you're doing? We've been talking about this for two years and we still don't have our mission statement done. And my attitude is kick it to the curb and just start doing something. You know, nothing is, everybody wants everything perfect and everybody wants everything in this box. Like give me the criteria so I can check it off. But when we do that, then it's just a task. And there's not the passion and the heart behind it that, that feeds and envelopes things forward. And so, I, and, and I also get a little worried about too much criteria because to me that stomps out the creativity, which is so critical. And it makes people feel like they can't belong or they can't make a difference. I, like, like Carrie and so many others, have had people call me up about memory cafes and so, you know, I'm really interested, but I know I can't do it. You know, I've been told I can't do it. I'm not a nurse. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. I'm, you know, I'm just a, I'm just a person who wants to make a difference. And I'm like, that's the only criteria that should matter is a person who wants to make a difference. So I think our approach has to be different. And, and we have to also be really careful because one of the things I will say I'm personally nervous about uh, and I and I'm not sure what the answer is to this, but the seed money that is given, because I think a lot of times seed money is used, it's established, and then when it's gone, people walk away because they don't have the funding. And now we've set families up for support, and it's not there anymore. And that I've seen that, and I've heard that happen multiple times. So I think we have to have this integrativeness that has which we were talking about online before we went live, where Harry was talking about, I don't want your money. I want your time and your resources. And I want this to be an authentic, organic process where everybody, no one's feeling strapped. No one's feeling used and abused. Like Michael said, everyone's voice is actually not just listened to, but it's heard. People with dementia don't want to be a token horse that you roll in the room and go, see, see, we got one. They want to be heard. And, and that's why I started Dementia Chats and Alzheimer Speaks and all of that, because we need to change the way we work together. We aren't real collaborative here in the U.S. And I think dementia is, is forcing us to be, because there's not time, there's not money, there's not staff. And there's no cure. There's no pattern really to this thing. Everybody is different. Every family's different. It's, it's unique. So it is constantly off guard, off guard, off guard. You know, learn to be spontaneous. Learn to be compassionate. And, and it's forcing us to be, I think, better people and work together. Uh, and so I think it's a beautiful opportunity. But people have to understand that when you are developing these groups to move forward, and again, this is just my deep down personal belief that goes through my toes and down into the ground. I'm just so firm in this. You don't go after titles and company names. You go after people who really wanna make a difference. And, and when you connect with those people, more things get done at a faster pace and I think at a more authentic and real level than you could ever imagine because they have a stake in the game and that stake is their heart. And, and I think that's really been missing in this world and I think it's a, 
uh, this is just such a beautiful, beautiful opportunity for us to all look at our similarities more so than our differences as human beings and say, how, how would I like to be treated? How would I like to live? What do I need? So with that, off my high horse, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to throw it back to Michael quick um, just to see if he has anything he wants to add, and then we'll go around here. I, I think I'm going to reserve my comments and wait for the other folks to make comments before I add any more. Sounds good. Um, Paul Ann, what are your thoughts? And then I'll go to Mary. I, um, I actually have a couple of thoughts. One thing I would like to mention is that I just got back from a conference, a dementia conference in Atlanta, and I was incredibly impressed by the attendees, not the people living with dementia, but, well, I was impressed by them as well. But <laughs> I mean, the um, nurses, the doctors, the uh, care home uh, facilities, they're starting to come around a little bit. I mean, they they have the enthusiasm and the attitude. They need the help with resources to do what they want to do. But they're start really starting to come around, and there's a lot of um, positive attitude out there. Um, the one thing I wanted to suggest to Michael as a, a one of the needs that I see in a in a community is a need to help people with money exchange. So in restaurants, in stores. You know, it's very difficult. I, I have a very difficult time with money. And I wind up just giving my credit card or I just throw a bunch of money on the counter and say and hope that everybody's honest. And so I think that that's one of the needs that I would like to see. Wonderful. Michael, go ahead. I think what you had said about that conference is really great. Uh, I have to tell you, I, I don't want it to influence you thinking that's the way the rest of the U.S. is because it's not. I think because the players, including yourself, have contributed to make that conference so successful and bringing awareness to the people who are connected to that conference. It's a small group, sadly to say, uh, but I, I hear you, what you're saying, and I think that is a great conference, even though I haven't been there, but I know all the players who have been there, and they all care with big hearts for people with dementia. And that's what we need throughout the U.S., not just at that conference. Um, I'm just going to mention the conference name. It was uh, Dementia Action Alliance. And I, I agree. I think it's a wonderful platform. Um, I will be honest. I don't think it's the best platform because it only happens once a year. I think we need groups of these people at every flipping conference there is. And their voice needs to be heard. Um, I have seen it so many times when I go around and speak and I have to fight to get people to put people with dementia on the schedule. And, and every time people come up, oh my gosh, I've been in this business 21 years. I, 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 thought, I, I thought I understood this. I thought I knew this. I, I, this was like the best session I've ever been in. When they actually hear and see a person with dementia speak and talk about what it's really like. I'm going to go to Mary and then Lisa and then Harry because I'm seeing hands and stuff moving around. <laughs> so, Mary? I think prior to the work that everybody does at trying to get people to get on councils or boards, I think the real fundamental job is to get the public to believe and to understand that we actually are still equal human beings with the same fundamental characteristics we had before we were diagnosed with dementia, that we are still valuable contributing members of society, that we still have ideas and creativity and originality and agency, and that we, can still do many of the things that we had been doing before. Now, the problem is that there is such a stigma attached to it that people automatically assume that we have turned into these worthless slugs of society. But the other part is that people also don't realize that Dementia is a lot more than 
simple loss of memory because it so it's it's educ it's a question of educating people that dementia is sometimes just a loss of organizational skills and that that's not one of the, part of our crystallized knowledge very often our crystallized knowledge whether we were professional bankers or or lawyers or professors or or journeymen we still have that knowledge we may not still have the hands that are able to perform the duties and we may not still have the office skills that allow us to arrange things so that we can still uh, actively participate in our profession but we still have the knowledge and i don't think that most of the country or most of the world understands that and so that's i i think one of the mistakes that we've made is not go back to the very fundamental part of educating the world then getting us on boards and getting us listened to will be a lot easier i agree i think there's a um a, a still a, a dramatic need for education and and part of it has even just been that uh, you know, the verbiage from Alzheimer's to dementia. And then people are like, well, what's Lewy body? What's vascular? What's frontal? I mean, they're like, what? We're like, those are like a handful. You know, there's many, many more types of dementia and they're all different. And again, it gets back to, we all deserve to live with dignity and purpose. Every single person on this planet, um, no matter what their condition is. And, and so it gets down to a basic respect and to be able to remove that fear because there's clarity of what this is or what the disease looks like so many people still think it's just people banging into each other in wheelchairs that can't talk that are drooling in a nursing home and you know they still have that picture of small um a strong smell of urine and i mean they need to get out in the world and see hey it's changed that wasn't acceptable and and that we have to move forward and and i agree um i, I agree wholeheartedly with what you have to say um lisa i'm going to go to you and then to harry okay um i have to say i agree with mary 100 percent because because where i live there's absolutely no no services at all and every time um, I try to get a group started somebody's gonna help me and then something happens and they don't they're not available and so I've been wanting to try to start something here I'm just kind of at a loss of what to do but I'm also raising three boys like you said earlier and um, time is hard to find but um, the thing is is that I think there are a lot of people that don't believe that I have dementia because I actually got into a bit of a argument, you might say, with um, family members um, that lived in another state that told me that um, only people, uh, people with dementia don't know they have dementia. It's only, so it's only painful for the people that are taking care of them because they're the ones that know that the person has dementia, but the person that has it doesn't have any idea they have it. And I said, well, that's interesting. When I came to your house, did I seem like a normal person? You know, um, I have dementia and I know it. <laughs> and I knew it before you did. So um, I just think that the lack of knowledge or the lack of understanding is huge, absolutely huge. And you know, there are things that look at me and I think I can do certain things that I no longer can do, but since I don't look funny or don't drool, like you said, or uh, any of those things, uh, I don't think people always realize that uh, we still need help, that it can be even a recipe sometimes has too many steps to, to get through. And so, like I said, I'm in Northern Indiana and if there's anything here, I don't know about it because I have been looking and um, and one association told me absolutely no that only for caregivers so and and really that's where most of the group started with was for the caregivers it wasn't for the person and I, I loved when you mentioned 
kind of almost being bullied for having an invisible disease that people, you know, if they can't see it, then it can't be real. Um, Michael, you had a comment, and then I'm going to go to Harry and Craig. Yeah, first of all, I, I don't know why we always try to get people to believe what our disease is or what the problem is. I mean, if the person has an issue with it, I just tell them to go to hell. It, it Really. I mean, why do we have to try to prove that we're sick? I mean, it, it absolutely makes no sense. Would they expect the same thing from somebody who had cancer to question whether they have cancer? Are these people doctors that they know something that they can even question whether you, you have this disease? So I, I don't even understand why we even attempt to argue with people like that. I just walk away from them. And it's not worth even discussing it with them. The, the second comment I have is, I got to tell you, I hear you in reference to trying to start something and it's very hard. I, I, I am very good at getting things started. It took me five years of continuously knocking it down people's doors over and over and over. They finally got sick and tired of hearing me after five years. And I kept sending emails and letters and bugging the government and people in my local community. Well, they finally said, some of the people, they said, hey, let's do it. Let's try it. So I think you beat down a door long enough, they get sick of you, and they just want to finally get rid of you somehow. And you just got to keep at it. I know it's not easy, but I would recommend that you just keep it, uh, you know, especially the caregivers. They're probably the easiest people to start with because they know their loved ones needed it. And they're probably somebody who could help you start that process. I'm going to add something in there because I think this is a shift too is I think you know we have been sold on fear for so long with this disease there's a there's a long road to kind of undo that damage and so part of I think the problem that that some caregivers care partners carers whatever you want to call them um, have is they have lost the belief that they can still have a good relationship with people and so that's where memory cafes have become so popular because it's like, I, I didn't, I didn't think we could go out and socialize and have fun and, you know, and not have to worry or be on guard. And, and that's something that we really, really have to change is, is to, you know, show that there is joy, there is life to be lived. No, it's not perfect, but you know what? Your life wasn't perfect before dementia. So let's just all get a little real about what life is really about here and how it works. Um, but, you know, we're only going to find what we're looking for, too. And and so that's very, very key. So so thank you, guys. Um, Harry, um, I know you got some words. I could get my soapbox out, but I won't. Everybody's all talk and no action. They love to talk about this. They love to tell you what they want to do, but there's no action. Um, when I was at Harrisburg, I was involved in the conference, and I told them, I said, this is my last conference. I won't be back. And they said, why not? And I told them, I said, you all talk or no action. I said, um, the wonderful opportunity for me is closing, and it's closing fast. Now, I am not going to spend what time I have left trying to convince you of the thing. It's like, it's like trying to change somebody's view on politics. You're not going to do it. You can beat your head against the wall all you want, but you're not going to change the views. And a lot of these people are the same way. They, they want to tell you how much they want to do for you, but when it comes time for action, there is no action. I would rather... I would rather take the approach I'm taking because I can prove to you the action, the results our approach is, is doing. Everybody wants to create a cookie cutter approach to uh, dementia. Let's do everything the same way. But you can't do that. I found out the hard way. You can't do that because there's so many different cultures out there that what works for you may not work for this group like when i got involved in the spanish community and the black community i had my eyes opened up because their culture is so much different that i had to change how i approach things a lot different 
but you know what? It works. We can make it work. Now, I get so angry because everybody wants me to speak at their conference or anything like that. And then they tell me how much it's going to cost me to, to speak there. Now, I just had a, I don't want to mention any names, but I was asked to speak at a conference. And they were even going to charge me to go to the conference. Then they were going to charge me a speaking fee. Then I had to pay my own expenses. And I got to thinking, no, you want to use me and you're not going to do that. And that's why my approach is changing so much that our movement is, is growing. Now, Everybody hears me talk about sentiment and the seven pillars of that, but that is growing. A lot of organizations are buying into it. They love the gentle care of somebody living with dementia. And the finding out that my approach doesn't cost anything. It costs time and resources. But you know what? A lot of these businesses, they write it off for a business expense, so it's a wooden win for everybody. You know, don't tell me how much you're doing for me when you write it off on taxes because that's benefiting you. Let's work together and let's knock out the nonsense and let's get some action done. As an example, we just came back from a trip to Bermuda. We took a cruise to Bermuda. And we we had it organized so well. Now, there was 19 of us from a memory cafes went on the cruise. But we all met at a local church where we had the memory cafe. We parked there. A bus came, took us down to Baltimore to the boat, dropped us off right at the boat. We had a group thing, so they took us right on the ship. No hassle. None at all. And the same way the reverse is true. The same thing. Now we have we have a train excursion that will organize it and other things like that. The social aspect is, in my opinion, more valuable than anything else. I think of functionality more than anything. If somebody has a high functionality, they're going to live longer. You know, I don't care what you're your cognitive test, my cognitive test scores suck, you know, but my functionality is high. So that's why I'm living such a good life. But trying to explain that to people, I, I stopped trying. I'm like Michael, you know, if you don't want to hear me, that's fine. Go away. You know, I want to reach the people that believe in what I'm saying and is willing to do something about it, not just sit there on the butts and listen, but let's get some action done. If I go to your place to talk about a memory cafe, I want to start up a memory cafe. I don't want to talk about it. I want action. That's why I've been going around to different uh, uh, nursing facilities to set up to set up memory cafes inside there for the residents inside there. Not an independent assistant living, anybody's invited to come. Now, I'll come and I'll talk to you, I'll show you, I'll even help you do it. But let's get it done. Let's set a date when we're going to do it. I, you know, I think that that is really important, Harry, that, that whole point of getting something done. Um, I think so many times groups, and, and you can look at it, from our politicians to whoever, it doesn't make any difference, but groups a lot of times do a lot of talking, but don't, don't always take the action. And it is, it's critical on many levels. I mean, you look at the numbers mounting with this and, you know, I, I have a phrase that, that um, progress is better than perfection. Just try. And even if it doesn't work, learn from your mistakes. You don't have to let your idea go, but learn from them. 
you know, the, the, this is precious time and any great entrepreneur out there will tell you they failed way more times than they've succeeded. But it's all about just trying to make a difference and know that you're, you know, when you're, when you're pushing for the greater good, there's, it, there's just a whole different feel than if you're just doing a job because your boss is down, breathing down your neck get something done and and walking away from people who don't want to learn don't want to listen you know is good in sales uh, you know they always say it's it's a matter of numbers and so it is it's still talking about it not giving up but but knowing when to walk away and sometimes that can be I know that was a hard lesson for for me in this process as well if people aren't aligned you know with where I'm coming from and not that I'm always right but I think I've got a lot of valid points in this arena and they might be different, but you know, just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean it's working. Maybe it did at one time, but it, it, you know, things, things change. And so um, very important. I also want to touch base on the speaking thing because I, I have fought um, tooth and nail for that as well. I get that still myself, oh, come on, you know, just pay your way, you'll have all these opportunities to meet people, you know, and it's like, you're all getting paid, you're all got benefits coming in, you know, um, it, it, that is not right. And so, and I think when it comes with, with dementia too, they have to be flexible because some people might be on a fixed income where they don't want to make money. But that doesn't mean that a portion of those funds can't, you know, um, travel expenses for sure should be covered. But maybe um, a portion of, of uh, a speaker's fee, if a speaker doesn't want it, maybe it goes to a memory cafe. Maybe it goes to, to another effort that they're working on. It doesn't mean that the value's not there. And, and I think that that's something that really does need to change, too. It's not just about filling holes with free people on schedules. And, and I see that happen a lot um, in my line of work, too, is just plug a hole, plug a hole, because everybody is, is stretched for time and, um, and budget on that. Uh, Craig, let's hear from you. And what, what are some of your thoughts? What are, what are some needs you'd like to see? Um, well. What was happening? I, I broke my leg back on the 25th of June. I've experienced a lot of physicians and doctors, and it's a huge hospital that I go to. And they need a guy like either a person like you or Gary LeBlanc to come there and educate the staff on dementia. Um, Several times I had to tell people, slow down, I'm not getting what you're saying. I don't understand, please slow down. And he'd slow down for two words and then right back at it again. Um, and the other thing, then they, they, they tell me to go in, I had to go in for an MRI. And they give you these robes and stuff and they all tie in the back. Well, I have no trouble tying stuff in the front, much less tying in the back. So I went back to the nurse's station and I said, is there somebody that can help me with this? Because um, I, 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 I can't do it. She goes, well, we don't normally do that. Um, just do your best, she says. Well, my best was to throw these robes on and put, put the robe over the top and they were unti untied. That's all I can do. But just, they don't understand at least this hospital has hasn't been trained at all in, in um, dementia symptoms and how to work with people. I think that's a, a great point, Craig. And one of the things that is a misnomer is everyone thinks, well, the doctors know, the hospitals know, the you know. But even if you search a hospital, a lot of times you can put in the word Alzheimer's and dementia, and nothing nothing comes up. And so it's like, how do people connect to the right people? And, and people at all levels need to be trained I don't, from, from the janitor to the surgeon, to the receptionist, to the person, you know, checking in, it just doesn't make any difference. And, and there's turnover. And so it has to, it, it has to be constant, um, you know, rendition of this and people have to walk that talk. Paul Ann? I just want to add, I, I was recently in the hospital for an extended period of time, 
and and uh, Craig is right. They they I told everybody up front I had dementia, but they didn't. They said, "Okay, fine, wrote it down," but that meant nothing to them in terms of how they reacted to me. They never called me by name. I was there for four months, and I was a room number. I was 462 needs medicine. You know, is how it went. And, you know, it was always like that. I mean, I was there a long time. <laughs> and I just, uh, I think the hospitals need a lot of training in this area. And, uh, you know, uh, common sense. Wow, talk about depersonalized. Your, your room number. I, that just made my jaw drop when you, when you said that. You know, we've talked a lot about um, what is needed. I'd like to mention a few things that I think are working well that I think need to be duplicated. And I'm going to go back to my um, Roseville group in Minnesota um, because I know a lot of um, dementia-friendly communities watch us and what because that's what I'm told from people um, all around but again I'm not seeing what we're doing reproduced and implemented all the time so one thing that I think has made a huge difference is what our group did was we got the, we got the city to buy in we got the school district to buy in and we got the library to buy in and with those buy-ins came their mailing lists and their contacts and so we're able to, you know, every educational program we do, it, it gets blasted all over. And the newspaper has bought in that this is important. Um, and so they'll give us article space for, for uh, press releases as well. But what the city did was they, uh, they gave us space on their official city webpage for our group. I have not heard of any other city in the U.S. doing that. And we were told over and over and over again by many different um, organizations and, and um, nonprofits that are supposed to support us, it'll never happen, it'll never work. And we're like, we're gonna try, what do we got to lose? So if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but we're gonna try. And it's worked beautifully because the page is pretty stagnant except once a month, one of our members goes in and updates all of the activities and it's not just our activities it's you know we've always taken the approach of we don't have all the answers but let's not duplicate what's what's good out there let's just help raise the voice and I think that's one of the things that's missing too is that true collaboration where you're not afraid of the other guy in what services they have because you know Every family is different and is going to have different needs at different times. And you just want to be that resource for them. So I think that that is um, a, a critical piece that's worked for us. Our library created what they call memory minder kits. And those are starting to take off around the country. But I think, like Michael said, they're all different names. And so nobody, you know, because everybody's got to be pri proprietary. And, you know, memory minders might not be the best name in the world, but it's a name. Don't spend time recreating a name to cause more confusion to the public. You know, just accept and give credit that, hey, thanks for sharing this with us and move on. Because when we share things, I think that's one of the beauties of the memory cafes. It was shared. It was given to us. It, there was nothing to buy, nothing to franchise. It was just build them and they'll come. And we don't really have that attitude here in the U.S. Everything's got to be owned and trademarked and stamped and protected. and which is too bad, but those memory minder kits are great. I mean, our library, um, I, I, I don't know if it was the first one, but it was probably, but my guess is it probably was, but our library systems have a section now for Alzheimer's and dementia because of these memory minder kits, a place where people can go because otherwise, where does it fit? Is it self-help? Is it medical? You get lost in, in all of those sections. And so, you know, just again, taking a different approach. The other thing that I think would be helpful, I was on our, our group for Minnesota for Napa, our Napa plan. And we were talking about, you know, becoming dementia friendly and how do we do this? And, and everybody wanted a criteria and everyone was going to have to be certified and everything was going to have to be, you know, checked and rechecked and recertified. And I'm like, 
we don't have any money or staff to do any of this. So why are we talking about this? You know, why don't we, why don't we just try to keep it simple and, and make, make what we can actually do happen? Why don't we not have um, a set criteria where we're going to score people, we're going to grade them? Why don't we have a tagline and mentors that can pick them up when they're down and feed them ideas and, and guide them along to find their niche in their community? Again, one of the hardest things for me to see is when creativity gets crunched, when people believe that they can't be part of this, that they don't matter enough, that they're not elevated enough or they're not professional enough to make change. Everybody can be involved in this movement from a young child to, to an elderly person at, at all levels, no matter what they're diagnosed with, you know, and it might just be holding somebody's hand or smiling, or, you know, or visiting. It might be um, knitting prayer shawls. It might be making cupcakes and visiting. It might, it might be reading books. It could be technology. There's all different things. Going for a walk with somebody. It doesn't have to be big and flashy and difficult. We're talking about everyday life here. And we just need to simplify it and tie in, weed in that compassionate and, and, and um, friendship that we, that we all want. And it can't all be about what we do for them. You know, as, as Bob would say with this poem of, I became they, and he's like, you know, as soon as he got his diagnosis, all of a sudden he was this different entity. It's, it's about what can we all do together? Because everybody has something to give. And, and that is, again, a critical, critical um, mass that, uh, that we need to work together. Last, I'm going to say um, our, our group in Roseville, and I'm really excited about this, we are working on launching in a massive survey about dementia travel, airline travel. And this will be able to be used um, all over the place. We're working actually with an international committee now on trying to come up with some guidelines and training to assist, and um, it, which will be real, real interesting. So that survey will be real important. But again, I, we need to get people to, to think small, but yet big because there's so much opportunity for change and we have, to, we have to share. And that's one of the things I think in the past 10 years I've seen the biggest change of is people are starting to share more instead of it's mine, you can't have it, you know, go, go do your own thing. So we've got about 10 minutes left here. I'm gonna go back to Michael. I, I have to tell you, I, I think this was a very interesting conversation we had here today. and. You know, listening to everybody, we're not even asking for much. We're asking for the most basic of the basic skills to help us out. I mean, it, it, it's so sad that the person in the hospital couldn't help him tie the back of his, his uh, gown. I mean, or to have somebody help you count some money in the store. And I know I've been there. I mean, it, that's the way I am. I, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to add the tip. I can't figure things out. And, you know, it, it, it's just basic needs, the simplest of basic needs that don't take a lot of effort for people to get other than giving a few minutes of your time to help someone. And to me, I think if we can just do that for people with dementia, we're going to be helping all of society to just be a nicer society to everybody and to each other. And I, I don't know what happened. I, I mean, I, I think 20, 30 years ago, people helped each other. They, they, they looked out for one another. But in today's world, nobody seems to want to do that anymore. And everybody's about themselves. And if we could just kind of take a step back and go back the way things were, I think we would have an implementation of helping people out without even really trying to define what that is. But it's, it's really frustrating when I hear that people can't get the simplest things that they need just to live within their own community or the doctors don't even understand. You know, he, he asks them to slow down and he says two words and then he goes back to his normal flying off the handle real quick. That happens to me all the time. It's like, how many times do you have to tell somebody, hey, I got dementia, speak slowly. 
you know, uh, it's frustrating. It, it's frustrating to hear that just some of these simple things could make our lives so much easier, yet people just don't get it. And they don't get it because they're not educated in what it means to live with dementia and the stigma that's associated with this disease. And we all here have proven it, how, yes, we have major skill set failures, but we're still able to communicate. We're still able to process at our speed and still able to do things that would probably turn circles around some people who don't have dementia, but we're just not given that opportunity. And that's sad. Uh, so I think I got my takeaway for this, and I, I think I, I know what to say. Wonderful. Well, I, I appreciate all you said in terms of summarizing. I think we do need to slow down and be present and, and work as a community. We've gotten so isolated, and that's one of the biggest issues. We need to connect. I wanted to add in um, two other things that I didn't mention quick. One was the Purple Tables Project, which um, trains restaurants on how to be dementia friendly, work with post-traumatic stress and autism and all kinds of things. We need more restaurants to filter into that program. They've got an app, they've got people that want to be able to go out and feel safe and comfortable and understood. And, and they've figured out a way to do that. So now we just need to get restaurants big and small involved. The other is a resource directory. Um, you can um, see it a little bit on my, my site, Alzheimer's Speaks on the resource tab but we need to integrate our information together and ProBalance has a great platform for that, but we need more people to buy into developing um, that um, so that people don't just get lost on, on Google. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, I'm gonna go to Mary and then Paul Ann. I don't have anything new to add. I would just reiterate the importance of um, trying to convince people that we are still human, once human, forever human, and that um, we should be treated with the same recognition, rights, and respect. That's my thing. Great, thank you. Um, Paul Ann? I um, just wanted to add in terms of resources in the dementia community, um, you know, something for social services, uh, uh, somebody to help people with social services. I mean, I'm just turning 65 and I've been to a seminar, I've been to a counselor on aging, and I still don't understand the whole thing. And I have to sign up for it in a couple months. So I think uh, that's a really important need. Oh, excellent point. Excellent point. Um, and, you know, over in other countries, a lot of those services come to the person in their own home instead of them having to go out to, which I would, I would love to see. Um, I, I think that would be fabulous. Uh, Lisa, how about you? I don't really have anything to add except I want to tell what's going on right now with me because it might give somebody watching this an idea of what we're going through. Um, I took my youngest son, um, I still drive, and I took him, drove him an hour to meet my dad, and I drove back, and then I had to go to the uh, repair shop with the car, and that's why I kept disappearing and coming back, because they were being loud, and I was moving around, and then I came home, and my son was asking me about the lawnmower, and where the keys, and what part you want mowed, and all that, and right now, my brain is so fried that I have not understood a single word anybody has said for the last five minutes. Thank you for sharing. That's, that's an important thing for people to understand. Um, Craig, how about you? Um, actually, I don't think I have anything to add either. And Michael covered it pretty good. Um, just just the, the, the community needs to know that there's there's little things happening out there. Like my, my phone, for instance, it's getting updates now. I was just getting used to the last um, update that they had. And now they come up with this new update and I'm lost. I have no idea how to work it, how to do it. Um, my son came over the other day and tried explaining it to me how to do it. And again, it, it, in one ear and out the other because it just doesn't make sense. So they, they got to be 
the community has got to be more aware of what they're doing, even with simple changes. Agree. And change in routine and, you know, technology can be a great tool to leverage. But, you know, when those changes occur, you know, it's difficult and, and bigger and better and flashier isn't always, always better for, for a person living with dementia. Harry, how about you? Every behavior is a form of communication. So if you want to understand what we need. Learn and understand the behaviors of us. And you will understand what we are trying to tell you what we need. Not what you think, but what we, what we need. I think that was an excellent point. And that was something we, we hadn't really mentioned was all the nonverbal communication. And, you know, there is a rationale for every reaction and even getting people to change their verbiage. Um, and stop calling it a behavior because, you know, when we're told we've got a behavior, that's not a good thing. When, when, we're, when, we've, when we've done something good, all of a sudden we got a skill set. <laughs> you know, but how many times do people refer to a reaction that you have as a behavior because it doesn't fit in their box or they're not understanding what's going on? So that is something that really has to change and understanding that most of our communication is nonverbal, but we get and excuse my language, but we get hell bent on, tell me the words, you know, speak at the pace I'm, I'm doing instead of slowing down and, you know, entering your world. Um, your world has a lot of gifts in it. Um, not that anyone would wish dementia on anybody, but there are a lot of gifts wrapped in the disease that, that I know I have found on my journey with my mom. And I wouldn't give them away for anything. And it gets back to, I think, what Michael was saying about we need to slow down. We need to be more present. We need to, as Mary would say, realize uh, that we are all human. And we have so much more alike than not. And we all have different abilities. Before dementia hit, our abilities were different. But we need to look at the abilities more so than the disability part to lift people up, empower them, and allow them to participate in maybe maybe new ways, but still doing the same thing, still feeling part of. We've, we've all been that person where we've been shunned or we haven't fit in, and we know how horrible that would be and is in our life. And think of feeling like that now because you've got a disease. People are making you feel like that for something that that is out of your control, nothing that you, you asked for, we, we, really have, we really have to live better and, and be better humans and connect on a whole different level. And again, like Michael said, this doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It doesn't have to, you know, strain people. You know, when you help somebody, when we volunteer you know, that gets our endorphins going. That makes us connect. That makes us feel better. It makes us feel purposeful. So why, why have we put that to the side as a society? We really need to ask ourselves and, and, and step up to the plate and step into it gracefully, knowing that when you give, you will receive even more. Well, thank you so much. This was a really, really, I think, powerful conversation and the points that you brought up. 